Um, so this talk that I want to give today is called Simple Solutions for Complex Problems. And you know, it, <coughs> we're really going to talk about NATS. And we've talked about it uh, earlier. And I think <coughs> NATS is, is interesting because it's simplicity. And that's really what I want to talk about. Um, but just to give a little bit of background on myself, uh, I'm the tech lead on the messaging team at a company called Workiva. And so we, we work on a lot of platform infrastructure, messaging infrastructure, um, of which NATS is a piece of that. Um, and so, you know, I want to spend most of the time talking about that and how we're using it. But before I get into that, I kind of want to provide some context and, and talk about how we think about system design and specifically how we design complex systems and distributed systems. Uh, and you know there are a lot of parallels between real-world systems and distributed software systems. If you think about like physical um, systems, there's a lot of similarities there. And the world is is kind of eventually consistent. Well, the database is just this optimization. And there's a really good article. Uh, it's down there at the bottom by Chris Micklejohn, where he describes how the world is eventually consistent and how the database is just this optimization. And you know, if we think about everything we know about some topic or some thing, that information, that knowledge is constantly changing and evolving over time. So there's never really a single point in time where somebody has a complete understanding of this, this one thing, right? And if we think about Wikipedia, it's just a database, right? It's a snapshot in time of everything we know about that thing. It's an optimization. Uh, and programmers, you know, we find that asynchrony, that eventual consistency, really hard to reason about. But the truth is, life is mostly uh, asynchronous. And our day-to-day -day interactions tend to be asynchronous. Uh, so what does that mean for us? And, and why is that interesting? And why am I talking about it? If we think about like the way that we've designed systems uh, for the past you know several decades, starting with like mainframes and time sharing, um, to like how we build monoliths uh, up till today, and how we build service-oriented architecture and microservices uh, and and whatever else that we're doing today, the complicated has kind of become the complex, and there's sort of been this increase in complexity over time, and. I think that's largely attributed just to the fact that things are more distributed than they used to be. Uh, and you know, the, the fact is distributed computation is inherently asynchronous, and the network is inherently unreliable. As much as we would like that not to be the case, that's just how it is. But we still kind of design systems the way that we used to, uh, in that we kind of assume they're not distributed at all, just because it's easier to reason about. You know, if you don't have to think about strong consistency, reliability of messaging, things are just predictable. But that's not how it is anymore. It's, it's fundamentally changed right, with the prevalence of cloud and, and so forth. And so you know, we kind of have to ask ourselves, what does it take to do that, to provide those, those types of um, guarantees? Well, it usually involves complicated algorithms. It involves transaction managers, coordination services, distributed locking, things that are, by the way, extremely fragile. And things that you probably don't really want to depend on, um, but we do it anyway. And you know, when we're talking about messaging today, um, in the context of messaging, we're usually interested in delivery guarantees. But what does that even mean? You know, does it mean that a message was handed to the transport layer? Was it enqueued on some mailbox? Um, did somebody start processing that message? Did they finish processing it? There's all these different definitions. And each of them has a very different set of conditions, constraints, costs associated with them. And things like guaranteed, ordered exactly once delivery, they're really expensive to provide. And depending on your definition, they might even be impossible. But regardless, you usually end up with something that's over-engineered, it's complex, it's difficult to deploy and to operate, it's fragile, and ultimately it's going to be slow. Uh, and you know, at a large scale, guarantees are going to give out. It's really the only thing that is guaranteed about distributed systems. And so, you know, even if that's a small percentage on a percentage basis, at a large scale, it's still massive. And so it's kind of this holy grail that we're after, right? We'd really like to have it 
makes our lives way easier. Um, and when we finally think we got it, something usually goes horribly wrong. And, and uh, you know, we, we get paged at 2 in the morning. And that's not good. So <clears throat> I think we have to step back and, and kind of reevaluate and rethink how we uh, design these types of systems. And so, <clears throat> you know, if we think about like replayability of messages, the fact that we can just retry or replay those messages, we don't care about guaranteed delivery. And if we can think about item potence and the fact that they can be safely retried, we don't care about exactly once delivery. And if we can think about commutativity and the fact that messages can be rearranged or reordered, well, then we don't care about ordered delivery. So if we can think about our systems and the interactions between the different pieces in that, that mindset, uh, you know, we can start to build much more resilient and robust systems, which is what we really need to be doing. Because again, things have fundamentally shifted. You know, we're building in the cloud, we're building with, with microservices, and things are distributed. But we also need to keep in mind that we're talking about messaging and delivery is not the same thing as processing. Those are two different things. And what does it even mean to process a message? It depends on the business context, the application semantics, right? And if you need business level guarantees, you really have to build those into the business layer because the infrastructure can't provide that. So this is, this is my attempt at being lazy and just putting tweets on my slides. but. People love to talk about TCP because they think it just solves their problems. Like it, it just makes distributed systems easy. But the fact is, yeah, it, it might guarantee that your packets get from here to there. Um, but that doesn't really mean that much to your application. Your application doesn't care about packets and, and bytes. It cares about like messages, the meaning of those messages, what gets done with those messages. It cares about the semantics uh, and the business logic. Um, none of which TCP gives a rip about. Uh, and so we really have to account for that end to end. And we can't just say we're using TCP so we don't have to think about these different failure modes, the things that can go wrong. Um, and when things are replicated, you know, it becomes 100 times more difficult. So <clears throat> we can always build stronger guarantees on top. We saw Stan introduced today. It's just a layer on top of NATs. We can't remove those from below, though. And so if you push those requirements and those guarantees down, uh, we force everyone to pay that price when they might not need to. So <clears throat> really what I'm getting at is, is the end-to-end -end argument. Um, if you haven't read the paper, I would really encourage you do, um, because it, it puts you in the right mindset of how we need to be thinking about these things. And the fact that the end-to-end -end system semantics are what really matter, um, certainly more so than just an individual building block. So basically what I'm getting at is, you know, distributed systems are a hard problem. That's just not going to change. And we can't, we can't just paper over that complexity. We have to, to engage with it. And we have to kind of embrace the chaos, so to speak. Uh, and <clears throat> you know, they say simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Um, and if you're not familiar with this symbol, it's, it's like a Buddhist or like a Zen symbol. And it, it kind of represents like the void, or it represents enlightenment. And that's kind of why Nats is interesting, because Nats, <coughs> it, it embraces the negative. It looks at the negative space. And what I mean by that is it, it kind of lets go of like, so looking at traditional messaging systems, they talk about like, these are the guarantees we provide. These are the semantics. That's just how we build systems. That's how we've always done it. It's how we continue to do it. Um, and Nats kind of lets go of that assumption. It lets go of those, those preconceptions. And it embraces that chaos and embraces the fact that you know, things are asynchronous, things fail, and we just have to account for that. And so <clears throat> it's kind of this simple technology in this vast sea of complexity. I mean, just looking at all of the different messaging systems, databases out there. There's so much complexity. And it, it, Nats kind of goes in the opposite direction of that. Uh, but of course, simple doesn't mean easy. So potentially two different, very different things. And have to have the obligatory Steve Jobs quote. But simple can be a lot harder than complex. And 
in many cases I think it is, but once you get to that point, things start to become a lot easier. <coughs> so I think that acts as a good segue into talking about what I really want to talk about, which is NATS and, and how we're using it. Uh, and just to give you a little bit of background um, about Workiva, so we have a platform called WDesk, which essentially allows enterprises to collect, manage, report um, business data and to do, to do that collaboratively, to do that in real time and so forth. And there's just an increasing amount of data and complexity of that data that our customers have to deal with. And so we build a cloud solution to, to address some of those problems, whether it in, involves you know, financial reporting, um, risk, audit, compliance, all the different aspects of the enterprise. Uh, so it's, it's basically a, a productivity platform for, for enterprise data. <coughs> and the first solution was built on Google App Engine, um, but scaling new solutions for our customers really requires a service-oriented approach. And scaling those, uh, those services requires some kind of, of low latency communication backplane, a way to integrate those services into that single platform. And you know, as you can guess, that's where NATS fits in. So why NATS? Availability really has to be your number one concern when building anything in the cloud, I think. And you, you kind of have to build with availability in the forefront of your mind and, and just deal with the consequences of that as a result. And NATS, you know, it does a lot of things to protect that, that availability. Uh, and, and it tries to be always on. Um, and it doesn't compromise on performance. So, you know, if you have a slow subscriber, slow consumer, it, it will just disconnect that consumer. Nobody else is impacted by that. Um, you know, if you have a lazy listener, if they're not responding to pings, they get disconnected. And so it protects itself to remain available. It doesn't compromise on performance. And the clients are cluster aware, so, you know, if I get partitioned as, as a client, I automatically fail over to another instance. We keep that availability intact. Um, and reconnect logic is built into the client. So you don't, as a client, you don't have to think about it really at all. Um, which is nice, and, and it also, the client will buffer messages for you. So if you become partitioned, you're publishing, they get buffered up, reconnect, flushes to the, to the server without even thinking about it. The other big aspect, and I touched on this, is simplicity. And you know, Nats really nails this one because it's, it uses simplicity to its advantage as, as a feature. Uh, and you know, it's a single lightweight binary, it's written in Go. Um, but the other big thing is it embraces that negative space that I was talking about. Um, and part of that is using simplicity to drive its performance, which we'll talk about. Um, but the other aspect is it, it doesn't have the complicated configuration that you know, a lot of other systems tend to have. And I don't want to name any names, but you, know, you don't have to deal with configuring like Zookeeper, etcd, um, these other external dependencies. And so it's just much simpler to operate. And that's key. Uh, and then the big thing here is, is it doesn't have those fragile guarantees that I was talking about. And I think that's big because it, it forces you to face that complexity head on. And you kind of, it encourages, you know, the asynchronous messaging patterns um, that we really need to be using. But what it does give you is just very simple pub sub semantics that give you this versatile primitive to kind of build interesting applications um, just with these, these basic primitives, you know, whether it's fan in, fan out, um, request response, et cetera. And then the last aspect is, is just a simple text-based protocol. And that's, that's big because it makes it much easier to you know, debug issues, to sniff messages, and even to, to implement your own client. Um, you know, if you've ever tried to implement like an AMQP client or a binary protocol for some other messaging system, um, it can be an absolute nightmare. And uh, NATS is the complete opposite of that. And of course, it's fast. And, and speed is always important. And, and NATS does a really good job at that. Um, you know, Derek knows this about me by now, but I do, I like to do a lot of performance analysis and benchmarking. And um, 
this is just one of those benchmarks. Um, it kind of shows the percentile distribution of latency, but it just shows how predictable NATS is in terms of performance, even up to like six nines latency. In this case, um, we're looking at, we're comparing it with like RabbitMQ um, for a couple of configurations. And, you know, RabbitMQ has much higher tail latencies in this case, but, you know, and again, comparing it to like Redis, PubSub, NATS just has really tight tail latencies. It's fast. So it's, it's fast, it's predictable, um, even at, at large scale, you know, can do roughly 8 million messages a second, depending on how you measure it. But the fact is, you know, it, it auto prunes the interest graph, so that's part of it. Um, and really when SLAs matter, it's, it's just hard to beat it. You know, you look at these, these graphs and if you have strict SLAs, I mean, you really don't have a lot of other options, to be quite honest, um, if you're looking at, at like six nines um, or even four nines. And I think it was, I think Jeff Marshall said something to the effect of like, when do SLAs not matter? Um, which is a, a fair point. And especially when it's something that's so core to your infrastructure, like a messaging system is. And so I think NATS really gets that right. So how do we use it um, at Workiva specifically? I wanna talk a little bit about that. You know, we're using it as a service bus. Um, we're doing pub sub, we're doing RPC, doing various types of asynchronous messaging. So at a high level, you know, we have some web clients um, we have some back-end services. Um, we have this notion of like a service gateway, which just provides like various edge services. And so all web, web traffic goes through that gateway. Gateway proxies that to NATS. NATS brokers the communication with, with our servers. And you know, the fact that NATS has queue groups, um, queuing built in gives us a really simple way to do kind of balancing distribution between those services. Uh, and of course that flow goes the opposite direction as well. So if we have services that are pushing things out to our client, like real time updates, um, they can do that as well. And then service to service communication goes entirely through NATS. There's no other pieces involved with that. So let's talk about PubSub for a minute. Um, when we're talking about PubSub, when we're talking about the publisher, the publisher is usually something like just send this thing containing these fields serialized in this way, using that encoding to this topic. And then the subscriber is like, well, just subscribe to this topic and then decode using that encoding and then deserialize in this way, extract these fields from this thing. Simple, right? What could possibly go wrong? Um, well, there's probably a few things that can go wrong with that, but even if you have like a schema or something that's well defined, there's just a lot of overhead with that, like mental overhead for developers. Um, and and you know the fact is, PubSub is meant to decouple services, but it, when it's done in that way, it kind of couples the teams that are developing them, and that's no good. So how do we how do we evolve services in isolation and reduce that overhead? Uh, so we built basically an extension of, of Apache Thrift. And if you're not familiar with Thrift, it's an open source um, RPC framework. It's open sourced by Facebook, I think. Uh, and you know, we built this extension to address some of the problems with Thrift, but also to add some additional features on top of it. And you know, one of those features is IDL and cross-language support for code-generated PubSub APIs. And so that allows developers to think in terms of services and APIs rather than opaque messages and topics, kind of the low level details that developers don't want to think about. They want to think about like services and the interactions between those services. And it also allows those APIs to evolve while maintaining compatibility, which is really important you know, with a service oriented or microservice architecture. And Thrift, you know, it separates out the notion of like transports and the serialization protocols and the, the RPC uh, layer. And of course, we, we're using NATS as our transport layer. So just to give you a taste of, you know, what that looks like, the pub sub stuff, um, you know, we have our IDL. Uh, in this example, we have an event, has some fields on it. And then we have a scope, we have this event scope. And 
a scope is basically, you can think of it as like a pub sub namespace, I guess. Um, so it has some operations within it. In this case, we have event created, updated, deleted, and then each operation is tied to a piece of data. So in this case, they're each tied to an event. Um, and then the scope can have, have an optional prefix on it, and that prefix is literally prepended to like the NAT subject, like the, the topic. And um, in this case, you, we have a user variable inside of the prefix. And so the prefix is comprised of like the, or the, the topic name is comprised of the prefix plus the scope name plus the operation name. So the point that I'm getting at here is that the developer doesn't have to think about that at all, right? They just define their service contract, their API. We take that IDL and then we generate some code. In this case, we have Go code. And so I can take my subscriber, I can subscribe to event created, uh, I pass in that user variable, I pass in a callback, which gets called with the event, and then I can create a publisher and I can start publishing things. So it's just much easier um, you know, for the developer to, to think in those terms rather than like, okay, I need this data and it has to be serialized this way and then I need to send it to like this topic. <clears throat> So I mentioned we're also doing RPC, um, and you know Frugal is a part of that since it's an extension of Thrift. And so the way we're using NATs as the transport with that is we have basically service instances which form a queue group, a NATs queue group, and then a client connects to an instance by basically just publishing a message to the queue group, and then that instance, one of the instances receives it, sets up an inbox, sends it back to the client, uh, and then the client just sends its requests on that inbox. But the nice thing about this is that it's really cheap to do that connection process because there's no service discovery involved. There's no sockets that we're creating. It's literally just a matter of publishing and then getting, the ba getting back a response and we're, we're done. So it's cheap to set up and tear down those connections. So I can connect to one server, can make requests. If that server dies or I get partitioned from it, I can connect to another server um, very quickly. And then we maintain um, the health of the server and the client. We check that using just heartbeats. <clears throat> so this is uh, an architectural diagram, kind of what we're doing. There's, there's more pieces, but this shows where NATS fits in um, to that architecture. And so we have ELB, which just gives us, you know, at the edge, like high availability for our HA proxy instances. And then HA proxy does SSL termination, load balancing. And we have this, this notion of a drone, um, but you can just think of it as like a VM. And each drone has containers running on it, like Docker containers with our services. And then each drone also has a NATS daemon running on it. And those daemons are clustered together. And so what that allows us to do is each service just talks to the daemon running on localhost. Um, and then the NATS cluster handles the cross communication uh, and then I, you know, I said earlier, the, the web traffic goes through that gateway. Um, that's actually called the messaging front end. So we scale that up depending on our capacity needs. Um, but it's just like any other service. So we store JSON containing the cluster membership in S3. And when we start up a new container, we just pull that, S that JSON down, set up the routes with the correct credentials and then you know, we're, we're on our way. And there's a number of advantages to, to doing this, um, to what we're doing. And the first is that we don't have to worry about encryption between services and NATs, right? We only have to worry about encryption between the NATs peers, the, the cluster members. And that makes things a lot simpler. Um, the second is only messages that are intended for a process on another host actually go over the network. So if, if I'm talking to another service which happens to be on the same you know, VM as me, that, that doesn't go over the network at all. Uh, and so that saves us a lot of network ops. You know, potentially, it's usually zero if we're on the same host versus like two or three to talk to a container that happens to be on the same machine as you. Um, and if the NAT statement goes down, we just restart it. You know, we make sure that's always available. <clears throat> 
Obviously, that doesn't scale to a large number of VMs. We don't really want to be running a, a NAT cluster of like hundreds of nodes, but it's easy to transition to a floating cluster um, or even just running NATs on a subset of machines like in each AZ. So the key thing there is that the NATs communication is entirely abstracted from the service. Um, so the service doesn't care where NATs is, whether it's on the same machine, whether it's somewhere else. It's entirely abstracted. And actually, NATs itself, we abstract entirely from the service by just put it, wrapping that in a library um, that developers use. And so the service just says, you know, I want to talk to this other service. And we handle the rest, or really NATS handles the rest. It handles the service discovery, it handles the routing, um, it handles the message delivery, you know, everything else. And that greatly simplifies things. Um, and then, you know, Q groups give us a quick, easy, out of the box way to do load balancing. So we're not an infrastructure company, we're a SaaS company. And so we really are not in the business of building this type of infrastructure, which is largely why we chose NATs, um, in addition to the other aspects that I talked about, right? The high availability, operational simplicity, performance, um, but also cross-language support. You know, a lot of messaging systems tend to be very JVM focused, and so if you're not on the JVM, you're kind of out of luck a lot of the time, um, which can be painful, and it's not the case, right? There's, there's a lot of really good, um, client libraries, first party client libraries, in addition to third party client libraries, and the number you know, is increasing. Uh, most of our services are Go, Java, and Python, um, all of which have good client libraries available, uh, and there's a number of others too. So that's how we're using it. Um, hopefully that was useful. Um, I just wanna leave you with a quote. Every solution to every problem is simple. It's the distance between the two where the mystery lies. Uh, I think NATS, you know, it's really interesting because, like I said, it goes in the opposite direction of what we're used to. It kind of flips those things on, its he on their head. Um, and it's really the direction I think we need to be heading in when it comes to building these types of complex and distributed systems. Um, so thanks for listening. That's all I got. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah.